continue where we left off last time. Uh, again, let's keep this interactive. Uh, let's understand what's happening when we are really in a ward round sort of situation. So, okay. So one of the most commonest things that you see on the ward rounds is a trolley, which is filled with a lot of chemicals and say, uh, bandages and uh, POP rolls or something. So let's start off with what basically is, uh, is this thing. So uh, what is a POP role? So if you, you get handed over as a POP role, what do you want to talk about it? Sir, it's a plaster of Paris bandage. It contains okay. cal calcium sulfate, hemihydrate. Okay. And uh, basically, uh, the calcium sulfate is uh, em em embedded into the cotton bandage, and it becomes a plaster of Paris bandage. And it's a ex uh, view. Basically, it's used. It's used in various forms as a, a splints for a, a primary immobilization of the fracture. And on application with water, uh, there is an exothermic reaction. The calcium sulfate hemihydrate becomes uh, bihydrate. Two H two O gets added to it. Great. So, what type of reaction is this? It's an exothermic reaction, sir. So these are the things that basically people ask or people expect out of you when you are in the when you are given this particular uh, POP uh, POP role. Okay, then again, of course, you could talk about the methods of application. It can either be used as a as a splint or it can be used as a cast. A splint is generally uh, not circumferential, whereas a cast becomes a circumferential sort of a bandage. Uh, it definitely can use for both primary and for definitive management of fractures, depending on where the fractures are. So if they are using it as a definitive mode of management, then you require to give a three-point molding for the plaster. And uh, if you're using it for distal radius and forearm fractures, then we need to make sure that the interosseous space is maintained and then that the three-point molding is good enough. Generally, it has a setting time of about Around 12 to 14 uh, minutes. Sir, so four to five minutes. It's generally four to five or four to six minutes. Uh, okay. And uh, this also is dependent on, on, on a lot of factors. Okay, so let's talk about this plaster of Paris. Okay, so there are, apart from this, there are a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of things that are uh, giving it to full strength. Okay, so, uh, Factors that affect how fast it uh, becomes hard is the temperature of the surroundings, the temperature of the water which it is dipped into, uh, whether the plaster is a pure POP plaster, whether it has a lot of impurities in it, uh, humidity inside the room, and they all also on the manufacturer. Different manufacturers will have different manufacturing time for the same environment and the same uh, uh, temperature of the water. Okay, so as you see over there, it is calcium sulfate hemihydrate, which in contact with water becomes calcium sulfate dihydrate with heat. So this is an exothermic reaction. So, uh, uh, so this is plaster of Paris. A little bit into the history of any idea of who was the person who uh, discovered or brought it into common practice. So this is basically gypsum. So. Uh, back in the day in and around France, uh, where there was a lot of military work going on, uh, that time they realized that when they went to firefight a, 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 a building built with uh, plaster of Paris or gypsum. So once uh, there was a fire in the building and they started to uh, throw water on it. Uh, so there was a lot of heat and uh, they kept throwing water on it. And then once the fire was doused, they realized that they had footprints or the uh, the prints of their shoes were in the uh, were in the POP, which they had already walked on top of. Okay, so then they realized this is something which becomes really hard uh, when it comes in contact with water. And it can be made when it is coming into contact with heat. So that's the basic idea, basic idea behind it. It was uh, discovered by a Dutch military surgeon, uh, Antonius Mathieson. Uh, Okay, so that's Antonius Mathieson. He's a Dutch military surgeon. So 
apart from Place of Paris, there are other uh, casts which generally don't come in the ward rounds, but you have to know that there are newer types of uh, Place of Paris uh, uh, substitutes. Okay, so the commoner ones are the fiberglass plasters. The advantages of a fiberglass plaster is that it is lightweight, it is strong, it is porous, and it is durable. And nowadays, there are uh, we have gone as far as making waterproof fiberglass plasters or polyester plasters as well. Okay, so they are lightweight, strong, porous, durable, and they are also radiolucent. Okay, uh, more radiolucent compared to the plaster of Paris cast. They also come in different colors according to the whims and fancies of the patient or the surgeon. Okay, now uh, coming to what is the functional position. Whenever you talk about the plaster, they will always ask you what is the functional position of the limb you are going to put the plaster in. And this is more often asked about the upper limb compared to the lower limb. So the functional position for the upper limb, for the uh, wrist, is going to be about 30 degrees of, uh, 30 degrees of wrist dorsiflexion. Okay, so this is going to be 30 degrees. Okay, so 30 degree dorsiflexion and there is going to be a 90 degree MCP flexion. Okay, so this is the uh, functional position of the wrist and the fingers. Okay, 30 degrees dorsiflexion in the wrist and 90 degrees MCP flexion and straight or 5 to 10 degrees of IP joint flexion. Okay, not more than that. So apart from this, they're also going to ask you what are the different, what are the uh, boundaries of the plaster. So say for the uh, short arm cast, for the long arm cast, for the short leg cast and the long leg cast, what are the boundaries? So make sure that you know all of these. And there is always a confusion regarding which palmar crease is where you stop. It is always the proximal palmar crease. The proximal palmar crease is where you stop. Okay, because if you keep your fingers on your distal palmar crease and try to flex your metacarpophalangeal joints, you will be able to feel the movement of those joints. That means the moment you're going to end your plaster at the distal, uh, distal palmar crease, that is not going to allow flexion at that joint. So if you keep it on the proximal palmar crease, you'd feel no movement at your MCP joints. Okay, try it out yourself and you feel the difference. Okay, so it ends at the proximal palmar crease. Of course, all the other... Uh, landmarks are very uh, uh, they are without any ambiguity so we will not be talking about them. Now instructions after a plaster plus application is that you always have to counsel your patient about why the plaster was, uh, was applied in the first place, when they should follow up and how long they are expected to stay in it. So it should never be that you have put the patient on a plaster and the patient comes back in two days telling that uh, doctor my pain is gone now remove the plaster whereas it has to be on for six weeks. So that thing should not happen. Okay, don't put anything down the plaster to scratch it, especially rulers, scales or any other outside objects. So the skin may get injured and will get infected within the plaster without showing any external signs. Do not get the cast wet. Do not break the plaster. Make sure that the fingers and toes are mobilized within the plaster, uh, within, uh, in the plaster while the uh, limb is in the plaster and elevate the casted limb to prevent any swelling. Apart from this, you have to show them the red flag signs. The red flag signs are increased pain and swelling, numbness or increasing pressure inside the limb, any unusual smell, any color change of the digits. Generally, it starts off with white, which slowly becomes uh, dusky to brown, uh, sorry, dusky to maroonish brown. Okay, and then eventually if the cast breaks off, please tell them to come back so that the plaster can be reapplied. Okay, so we are talking after vascular uh, uh, we are looking at compartment syndrome and uh, vascular compromise when we are talking about these things. Okay. So apart from that, uh, we have a lot of chemicals. So uh, I think I will just uh, go one step back and I will name the chemicals one by one and please uh, you can come up and tell me what uh, are the things that you generally see. So the first chemical if I am on the ward rounds, I will give is, uh, say, a bottle containing H2O2. So what is this bottle? Hydrogen peroxide, sir. It's a bottle containing yeah, hydrogen bottle. peroxide. Sir, it is used as a de-sloughing agent. Usually in infected wounds, we can use, or in wounds containing slough, we can use for 
and also it is used for chemical cauterization of vessels okay and how does it act how, what is the mechanism of action sir there is a secretion of nascent oxygen sir very good okay so basically this is hydrogen peroxide hydrogen peroxide helps uh, act as a desluffing agent by releasing nascent oxygen uh, uh, it, it has a cleansing effect it is not basically antibacterial or anything. It is basically only a cleansing effect. It froths and brings out the debris from the wound. Okay. If, since there is nascent oxygen which, which is being released, it works against anaerobic organism because the anaerobes get killed with the help of any oxygen supply. It, use, it is used as a chemical pottery as you already talked about and it removes blood stains from the skin as well as the clothes. Okay. So next, I will be handing over a, a bottle of uh, orange color liquid. Uh, it doesn't have any labels on it. It's yellowish to orange in color. Any ideas what it can be? So it's Savlon. Okay. So what is what is the Savlon? What does it contain? So cetrimide and chlorhexid in gluconate and alcohol, uh, isopropyl alcohol, sir. Very good. Uh, sir, it, so uh, its main effect is uh, disin it acts as disinfectant agent or we can use it as in cleansing agent also. Uh, 